Hi folks, we'll give it just another minute before we get things kicked off this morning. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's LFN webinar. The topic for today is Fido's VPP smashes the barrier to wide scale adoption of inexpensive high performance IPsec. Um, we've got a great group of experts discussing uh, Fido VPP with us today, starting with Neil Hartzell. He's the CMO of NetGate. We've got Audian Paxton. He's a senior director of PLM with NetGate. We have Don, John DeGilio. He's a software product manager with Intel. And then we've got Jerome Toyer. He's a distinguished engineer with Cisco. And we've also got Aloise Augustin, a software engineer with Cisco. Before we officially get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all attendees will be muted during the session. Um, however, there is a Q&A window. So if you have any questions that pop up throughout the presentation, feel free to type it in that window. And we do have some time dedicated at the end of the presentation to go over those questions. Also, the slides and recording of the presentation will be available starting tomorrow. Um, and an email link with where you can find those resources will be emailed to all registered attendees. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to kick things off. And I'm sorry, I'm going to hand things over to Neil to get us started. Thank you, Jill, and welcome everyone. Um, I will get right into the, the presentation here. Appreciate you attending today. Get the uh, controls going. Uh, we'll just start with a brief outline of what we're gonna cover. The idea here is to go through this material in about 25 or 30 minutes and then leave 15 minutes or so for question and answers at the end. Um, we often have a wide and varied audience for these kinds of webinars, so I'll just spend a few minutes uh, refreshing everyone on the basics of IPsec, uh, why it has become more important, um, a challenge that it faces, and then we'll get into the meat of what vector packet processing is all about, um, give you several examples of VPP in action with IPsec, and then close with a summary. So uh, just as a brief overview, um, IPsec is essentially a framework for encrypted and secure connections between any two points. Um, as you can see in the primer, it has a set of elements. I won't go through that in detail. Uh, it's there for the reading. Um, it stands for obviously Internet Protocol Security. It is an IT IETF standard and it was established in 1995, which is you know, some time ago. Um, you may wonder, so what's the big story here for a protocol that's been around for some time? And we're gonna get into exactly that. I think most people are probably aware it is heavily used in virtual private network technology, um, whether that be host to host or network to network or network to host type applications. So what's interesting is just looking at the growth in encrypted traffic. Um, here is a uh, graphic on the right side from Bond Internet Trends that just shows you from the first part of 2016 until the most recently available data, which is uh, first quarter of 19, now you know, well over a year ago. And we see that there's almost 90% of web traffic is encrypted, which is an enormous uh, growth rate from just over 50% um, a few years prior. Now, that web traffic is not all IPsec. There are other protocols in use, um, TLS, SSH, PGP. But IPsec is a, a highly regarded uh, framework, and it's probably the most established of this set for VPN usage. 
Now, you might wonder, well, what's really driving this uh, precipitous growth of encrypted traffic? And I, I expect many people are familiar with these points, but it doesn't hurt us just to revisit them quickly. Everyone is aware of the security dilemma, so we don't need to belabor that, but many um, companies and solution providers have tried to guard against that through encrypted traffic, especially with respect to stopping data loss. Um, it's certainly been in the news that social media platforms are using encrypted traffic increasingly. Uh, that's a story unto its own and beyond the scope of this particular webinar, but uh, a fascinating topic. No question the movement of applications and workloads to the cloud is having a big impact. Um, people don't live in the cloud, but if applications do, we have to connect to them in a secure fashion. And so that is having a, a, a huge impact. And then of course, just the overall rise in worker mobility, which has been going on for decades, um, requiring that people have VPN connections from their home or from a travel location, either back to their office or uh, back to a corporate data center or back to an internet placed application. And as I'm sure everyone is uh, painfully aware, the pandemic is only um, exacerbating that problem. So these are the things that are driving encrypted traffic. And that leads to a challenge. And the challenge is, in a word, it's not cheap to do this. It's a tough job to manage connections and encrypt all packet traffic. Do it quickly, do it transparently, and especially do it inexpensively. This is a supreme challenge even here in 2020. This challenge gets worse when you start to scale um, encrypted tunnel connections from one gigabit to 10 to 40 or even higher. Um, and the problem is traditional routers and traditional VPN approaches just don't handle this scale very well, certainly not at low cost. And so we have to have a different way of attacking this problem. And if you see the graphic on the right, it's, it's a little bit uh, obvious, but this is what a network connection looks like. And if you have to encrypt each of those vehicles at, at on and off ramps, it, it's a big job. And again, we can do this, we can do this with expensive equipment, but that's not a good scale answer. So we'll get into what VPP does to address this problem, but before so, let me just uh, add a commercial for FIDO, which is the presiding open source project where vector packet processing lives. This is a nice diagram from the Linux Foundation networking uh, group and it, it, it might scare you because it shows you there are a number of open source projects at play up and down the stack, which is represented on the left, from the bottom or the basement of disaggregated hardware all the way up to application layer controls. And so that you don't get lost, FIDO is one of the projects and it's highlighted there with the you are here symbol. And it is an open source project. It focuses on high performance IO services for dynamic compute environments. Uh, FIDO is one of the founding members of Linux Foundation networking. And the types of people who should be interested in FIDO and what it has to offer range from network infrastructure and service provider uh, organizations to cloud service providers, enterprises, and of course, there's a host of vendors who will ultimately want to leverage this technology for, for their own uh, commercial purposes. So that's where FIDO lives. We really live at the, at the data plane. So let's now go into the specifics of uh, vector packet processing, or as we uh, refer to the acronym, VPP. VPP, very simply, is super high performance software packet processing. Now there's a lot to unpack there, but the number one thing to remember is this is all done in software. Um, the second thing to know right off the bat is it is uh, done in user space as opposed to traditional
kernel space processing. And effectively, it performs an action on a, a, a vector or a group of packets all at one time, as opposed to processing a packet uh, policy or instruction at a single packet at a time rate. And so this is the, the fundamental difference that allows it to scale um, up to a couple of orders of magnitude larger than what we can get out of traditional uh, kernel-based processing. It's very extensible, it's very capable, it's easily programmed. As you see in the diagram on the right, you take a group of packets, and we call that a, a fancy term, a vector, and you subject that vector to a set of graph node processing instructions. And based on policy controls or programmed um, capabilities, you can force these packets to uh, different uh, policy or rule-based engines and treat them accordingly for how they should be routed or perhaps how they should be blocked, so forth. So it's, it's very, very capable. We're really at the early days of what you can do within the packet processing graph, but certainly high-performance routing and handling of IPsec is, is ready for prime time. The other thing to note is VPP can be deployed virtually anywhere, from bare metal to container, um, x86 hardware all the way to PowerPC. So it's quite, um, uh, quite capable. Let me get into a couple of examples here that will just give you a sense of the, the speed that we're talking about. I'm gonna go through an iPerf example, which is what you see in this slide. And then the next slide, we'll talk about an iMix uh, case. So iPerf is typically tests where you're running uh, 1500 byte packets to see how uh, solutions can perform. And an obvious use case for that would be downloading a very, very large file. Perhaps there's an organization like a university that is mapping the ocean floor and they want to be able to move large files quickly and it needs to be encrypted because they're doing some uh, special proprietary work. What you see in this particular graph um, are three actual products. We're, we're not naming them because this is not a, a vendor pitch, um, but they are Atom-based uh, and Xeon-based uh, processors. These are hardly, you know, the latest and greatest. Um, so, you know, the, the processor world changes rapidly. But effectively what you see here is that VPP enables um, AES-128 GCM encrypted traffic to be pushed through uh, connections at about four times the rate of speed that we can get from a traditional kernel-based processing solution, in this case, PFSense. Now, here's the trick of this graph. It, it's basically a 4X when you compare blue candles to orange candles, but the most important thing to note is the hardware underneath. And for PFSense, we were using uh, all four cores of what a particular appliance had to offer. And with VPP, we chose to baseline the performance just using a single core. If we light up additional cores, that orange candle gets even larger and, and rather quickly. So we did this again because we're not trying to uh, tell a hardware story here, we're trying to tell a, um, a unit of measure story. So if we can tell you this is what VPP can do with IPsec using 1500 byte frames on a single core, you can go out and find your own hardware solution and bring that power to bear. Now, the next slide is a more difficult challenge, and this is iMix traffic. iMix is a good measuring stick for real world internet traffic where you're dealing with voice packets at 65, uh, 64 byte uh, frames to data frames that can be all the way up to jumbo size, 9,000 bytes and then video, which of course is uh, you know, latency sensitive. So when you mix that traffic, it's a harder job to process IPsec, specifically because you're doing something instructionally to each packet. And if you have to do that to 64 byte packets, there's gonna be a whole lot more of them. So it will strain uh, what you can get, but you see we still are enjoying anywhere from 7X to uh, 2X advantage again, with a single core, and as you add cores, those candles go even higher. 
Um, we're representing on the right that we tested this using Tensor and PFSense uh, as a solution, which are both available from NetGate. The only reason we're doing that is because we have the ability to test both software packages on a common hardware uh, platform underneath. The third point I'll make is, since I have uh, stressed that we did our VPP testing with a single core, is as you add cores, you will get performance scale. Now, it is not a linear game. It does level off, but you can see here, just adding a second core still gains anywhere from 57% to 75 plus percent. And so the point to take away there is cores are cheap. And as you're gonna learn later in this presentation, cores are getting more powerful from a software and a hardware instruction set point of view. But we can scale software very cost effectively to take advantage of any hardware you put underneath with VPP. So that's really the power of what FIDO has delivered um, in a nutshell. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Audie and Paxson, who will be the first of our three vendor presenters in this particular webinar. So Audie. Thanks, Neil. Um, so I am going to talk about a customer case study. And so the, the first slide I'm gonna show is um, about uh, a customer, the customer, uh, customer's problem. So if you can go to the next slide, Neil. Perfect. So this is a this is with a, a a biotech company, and this biotech company they process a massive amount of data as part of their service. And as they grew, and the amount of work that uh, they started to you know the, the amount of data they were working with uh, increased exponentially. And so they moved their uh, their compute to the cloud because it's very uh, um, in intensive work to do the processing of the data for, that they work with. And at their goal is to be able to, you know, get compute jobs to finish much faster and, and running them on much larger clusters. And to, to give you an idea of the scope of this, we're talking about in order of like 500 extra large instances in AWS, which is equivalent to about 24,000 uh, physical CPU cores. So it's, it's a massive amount of data. So by moving it to the cloud, there's some big benefits for them in terms of processing. Um, but that also created some other problems in terms of uh, you know, their ability to access that, uh, that data um, for analysis. And that, create, that created some bottlenecks in their network. The result of that means that they, uh, they have researchers that are pretty expensive you know, scientists that uh, sometimes have to wait days to be able to, uh, to do their analysis of the data. And that costs the company a lot of money. So on the next slide, I want to um, show you what their network looked like um, currently or before and then after. So the, the current network actually, and this is kind of, um, it's a part two part thing, but it doesn't have a build. But what they have is um, they have their data center and that's you know their colo where, you know, where everything is stored. And then they've moved every, all their compute out to, um, to AWS. And they're also using AWS for disaster recovery as you'll see in the upper right hand side. Um, when they did this, they're the bottlenecks they are in these blue boxes, these little chiclets. So the first bottleneck is a result of, um, due to their legacy router, which um, has a limit of, you know, half a gig of encrypted traffic. And that's the most they can do there. Within AWS, they, uh, between VPCs, they're using um, AWS VPN gateways, and those have a max of 1.2 five gigs per stream. So being able to do replication um, across with, with this amount of data across all the VPCs and their data center, that's a problem. They've added a, um, a hosted um, AWS Direct Connect and that's, that solution is capable of, of 10 to up to 500 gigs. That's to AWS, to the cloud. So um, they're still constrained even with that connection. That doesn't solve, uh, address the bottlenecks on each side of that. So the next slide, we'll, um, what we're gonna look at is what we're doing, what they're doing with VPP as part of Tensor. And Tensor is a product of ours that um, is, uh, you know, VPP is a key part of that uh, uh, product offering. So 
with this solution, first thing they did is they, um, they're putting Tensor at their colo. That helps free up the constraint that they have with their um, the proprietary um, router. So that's gonna be able to make use of the AWS Direct Connect um, service that they've installed. Initially, they're looking to get up to, you know, 100 gigs of connection up to the cloud. Now they install, they're installing that on a, an off the shelf Dell server with Intel Nix. And, and in, in the cloud, they're putting virtual uh, instances of Tensor. And each of those instances are placed on every one of their VPCs with a, an encrypted connection between the two. So this is bypassing the, um, the AWS VPN gateway because those still have the limit, at least per stream, of 1.25 gigs. So, um, and then that right if, on the first phase, this allows them to be able to um, do five gigs, which is a huge improvement compared to what they were at. And then they can add multiple instances using ECMP to be able to get up to um, 100 gigs of throughput, which is uh, their ultimate goal. So that's the design and the approach that they decided they want to go with using this technology. As part of that decision process, they wanted to kind of dig into the actual some benchmarks. So in the next slide, we'll talk about the benchmarks that they uh, that they looked at for the uh, for deploying Tensor with VPP to the cloud. So this is this is. Um, this is on a, uh, the test configuration for this benchmark is using a standard you know, Xeon uh, processor and Mellanox Nix. Again, this is a, a, a general, uh, a generic white box server that they have, um, that they're gonna be able to use. And as Neil was talking about the differences between the type of workloads, iPerf versus iMix, in their case, they're dealing with uh, big jumbo frames. So the, the numbers they actually care about in this case is are gonna be you know, the 1500 packet sizes on that order. So what we're able to do is show them and de demonstrate the type of throughput they can get as a result of using VPP um, in, their, uh, in their router to the cloud on the order of you know, 12 using a single, uh, 12 up to 32 gigs of throughput. And you know they're going to be making use of, of QAT, um, quick assist technology, um, to, to help with that for sure, and, and um, at least at their data center. On the next slide, what we want to talk look at is they wanted to know what can we do in the cloud, and, and I say in the cloud, or really more specifically, it's inner VPC. And that is the connection between each of those VPCs with a, a, a Tensor virtual instance deployed on each one of those. So. And the test results we have right there, um, using one or up to four streams, um, they were able to, you were able to demonstrate, you know, four to, you know, actually almost five, as I recall, just under five gigs of throughput uh, between VPC instances. So that addressed two things for them. Obviously, that was a very good proof point that they're going to be able to get the performance they want in phase one. And then using multiple instances, they're going to be able to, you'd be a, using ECMP, be able to get 10 to 100. It also saves them money um, by not having to pay for use of, um, of AWS uh, VPN gateway. So you get the performance bump and also they're saving money. So that's a, the most basic, uh, basic example of a customer, uh, a real world customer who's making use of um, the benefits uh, of the VPP brings. And so, I'm, and next I'll hand this over to uh, Jerome Tollet. Th thank you. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about um, how we can leverage uh, IPsec in the context of uh, Kubernetes. So there's a project named uh, Calico VPP that we are working on. And, and the goal of this project is, uh, is to integrate a VPP fast data plane with Calico. Uh, Calico being one of the leading CNI in the market to bring fast user space networking to Kubernetes, right? So instead of using regular Linux kernel to, to do the forwarding, the netting, and, and all these uh, data plane features from, uh, from Linux being used for uh, Kubernetes, we do that with using, uh, using FIDO VPP. So of course, we did that to bring a super faster performance, right? The project is still early, but it already supports you know, uh, IPv4, IPv6, 
um, services, you know, also known as Kube proxy or load balancing, VXLAN, IPIP, of course, IPsec, and I'm going to go in more details about that, NAT, and there are a bunch of other things coming up, right? If people are interested, I, I did put a couple of slides uh, of links here, right, on Slack or uh, on the GitHub because the project is part of the official uh, project Calico, right? Uh, what we've seen lately is that uh, many uh, CNI, so CNI being the sort of SDN for Kubernetes, for people who may not be familiar, so CNI layer is really the layer in charge of uh, networking in, uh, in Kubernetes. So the CNI, many, uh, many CNI now offer uh, encryption, right? Mainly, I would say, for uh, you know, regulatory uh, compliance requirements. Um, but also, it makes uh, things much easier because if you want to do crypto in Kubernetes, of course, you know, people uh, can use, can do on-pod, in-pod, you know, crypto with technologies like Envoy, TLS, and so on. But then, in time to times, people, you know, do not control what are the pods which are deployed. So that may that can make things a bit complicated. If uh, you do uh, server-to-server -server crypto with IPsec or with other crypto uh, technologies then you have the guarantee that uh, everything is ciphered. So I think it's why it's becoming popular. And um, again, most of the CNIs today, including uh, Calico, Cilium, uh, Weave, all of them now offer uh, um, crypto uh, for server-to-server -server communications, but it comes with a severe uh, impact on performance, right? So practically speaking, when you want to deploy them, you're gonna get a performance hit. Right, and because of what uh, what described before, VPP does have a super high performance in, in terms of IPsec. Of course, that's one of the things we wanted to leverage in the context of uh, of Calico VPP. So, in the next slide, next slide, please. Um, you can see that uh, I, I just want to share with you so what what do I mean by uh, high performance? So we did we did a bunch of tests always using, uh, you know, Skylake, Intel Skylake CPUs, and, uh, and all these tests were done with a TCP with a 1500 bytes uh, packets, right? And the tool we used for that was uh, IPerf, right? So very simple test, IPerf server running in a pod, IPerf client running in another pod, and we did, you know, pod-to-pod uh, -pod communications with pods running on different uh, servers. So here are a few, few, few numbers I'd like to share with you. When we do pod to pod, unidirectional, so one client talking to one server with IPerf, so on two hosts, with one thread, one Skylake thread, and one IPsec tunnel, you know, uh, with IPerf, so IPerf to IPerf, we were able to do 12 gigabit of uh, good put, right, with one thread. Then we, we, on this particular setup, we had a 40 gig uh, link, so we did uh, four threads with four tunnels, and we were able to go up to 30 gigabit per second, right? Which is basically link speed, because if you remove the IPsec header, TCP header, 36, 36 gigabit is, is link speed, right? So that's the first test we did. Then we said, okay, let's do now a by uh, you know, a full duplex test with uh, not a client sending traffic to a server, but really both, right? So receiving and, and, and sending, right? So we did the first test at uh, 10 uh, gigabit per second, um, uh, X2, right? Because we have 10 gig uh, being sent plus 10 gig being received. In order to do, so that's uh, basically uh, 20 gig of, uh, of packet processing. In that particular case, with, uh, two, with uh, alpha thread, we were able to sustain uh, 20 gig of packet processing without encryption. Then we turn, when we turn on encryption, and then by encryption, I mean IPsec plus AES GCM to 56, uh, with two threads, we are able to uh, sustain uh, 20 gig of, uh, of traffic, right? 20 gig of packet processing, so 10, 10 gigabit each uh, direction. I, again, pod to pod, so unmodified IPerf talking to another unmodified IPerf, right? Uh, then we said, okay, what, what, what can we do at 40 gig? So that's 80 gig, 80 gig of, pack, of, of processing, right, of IPsec. And again, with VPP, we, we did that, and uh, with only uh, two threads, we, without encryption, we were able to uh, process this 80 gig of uh, traffic. So then now we uh, turned on uh, uh, encryption, and that required six additional threads. So net-net, in this particular case, 
we were able to process 80 gig of traffic with IPsec uh, crypto, with AES GCM, really pod to pod, right? So that includes the, the cost of, uh, of uh, that, that includes also the bottom, various bottlenecks you, you can have in other places, 80 gig of traffic with the eight threads, right? So that's what, we, that's what we've seen. Uh, we did limit us uh, to this test for now, but there's more to come soon. Uh, recently, uh, you know, VPP um, uh, added support for uh, asynchronous crypto, which basically means that uh, instead of, uh, we, we can now break uh, the barrier of uh, fat flows. So as you can see in this test, one single thread with one tunnel uh, you know, is uh, 12 gigabit per second. But um, what about the fat flows? So, so with this new evolution, uh, we're going to be able to sustain 40 gig plus fat flow IPsec tunnels on uh, uh, leveraging multiple cores, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be another uh, very interesting thing because we, we won't have to restrict ourselves to uh, 12 gigabit uh, uh, IPsec tunnels, which is, which is, not too bad, right? It's actually considered 12 gig can can be considered as a, as an elephant fold already. But now we're going to be able to go to the 40 G or 100 G uh, elephant flows. Um, in terms of performance gains, we're also working very closely with Intel uh, to take benefit of uh, upcoming Intel architecture, including scale, including the Ice Lake and so on. But I will let uh, um, John Digiglio talk more about that. Um, if folks are interested, we did write uh, an article on Medium, so feel free to have a look at it and uh, ask us a question if you have to. Bye, thanks. So, John, can you continue, please? Yes, thank you, Jerome. So, as Jerome hinted at, uh, I'm going to give an update on as a uh, vendor of the technology at the bottom of this great software where we're going. And so you'll see here an announcement we made exactly a month ago. So at the Hot Chips Conference, which is public information, we provided lots of innovation on, on our upcoming Ice Lake scalable processors. But I wanted to focus because of today's webinar on the crypto enhancements. And you can see that uh, significant silicon has been added. Uh, paying attention to what is a very important workload we've been discussing today. We vectorized the AES, so now you could do much more parallel processing, fits VPP just perfectly. Uh, but in addition, we've also added a new set of instructions to help with public key generation. So as before, software was addressing the symmetric type processing, including AES GCM, now we're going to be able to also tackle um, many more of the encryption algorithms uh, and, and things like SSL and so on. And so you'll have choices here, but as you can see, significant improvements in what you can do in software on our upcoming Ice Lake scalable processor. Let's move to the next slide. Um, but I also want to remind the, the audience that uh, Intel sees this workload as very important. And so we have investments across our complete processor roadmap. We have both um, Quick Assist hardware acceleration that's integrated into our SOCs, also available with our scalable processors. And so that complements the software very nicely in that uh, as Neil opened this up, it's very expensive to do this encryption, especially when you're doing public key generation. And so we give the uh, end user and, and the vendors the option to, to look at both uh, if software meets the requirements or if you need additional hardware acceleration. We're very pleased to be working with the FDIO community and the BPP solution in that uh, you could see exactly what's available and I've given a, a few links here to what is uh, available for test, ongoing test capability within our continuous um, system integration and testing project that's part of FDIO. So as you'll see, as we release the new Ice Lake uh, scalable processors, we'll refresh the public lab and you'll see new measurements uh, that show what new capability is available with a combination of BPP and hardware. Let's uh, go to the last slide here. 
Uh, also, for uh, both uh, vendors uh, and as well as end users, I want to assure you that uh, we're making this as easy to consume as possible. And so within VPP, some of the uh, encryption use will go to software. Some will take advantage of quick assist hardware acceleration, and that's both based on what is more efficient. So what do you do to minimize the compute cycles that the CPU has, as well as uh, you may be running, as uh, Neil said, in an AWS um, EC2 instance, and maybe quick assist is not available there, but the same, same software will continue to offer the application benefits. And so you can see that our libraries, both within BPP, as well as even the OpenSSL framework with LibCrypto, include startup logic that uh, determine where they've landed the application on. Is it on a, a EC2 instance that has a particular generation of Intel CPU? Does it have quick assist? And we initiate the algorithms to go to either hardware or software or special software libraries. So again, this is our way to make sure that you can take advantage of whatever is best in the target environment. Thank you for giving us the, the time to look at the technologies and where BPP is going. Thank you, John. And thanks as well to Audien and Jerome for the, the three examples where VPP is being used live and uh, is, is shows extremely strong promise for cloud native use. And of course, as we're saying here in the end, and as John shared, there is more to come. So just a quick recap, and then we can open this up for any questions the audience may have. Uh, it, it should be clear that VPP itself provides a significant enhancement in IPsec performance capabilities. Um, and ultimately, this will reveal itself in, in very, very strong price performance ways. Uh, without getting into the commercial side of this, which is not the scope here, really, you can now think of having, you know, 100 gig IPsec processing platforms running largely in software on hardware that is really down in a few thousands of dollars of cost. And to have a 100 gig type IPsec solution in the past, you would have spent two orders of magnitude on that uh, and, and still can spend that today without, uh, without strain. Uh, the gains are broadly applicable. You can apply VPP uh, in premises solutions or in solutions that uh, are, are geared towards um, premises to cloud since we know the workloads are moving there rapidly. And then as Jerome shared in cloud native environments all three. Um, John shared some very interesting points from a uh, software instruction and hardware acceleration perspective. So this is only going to get better. The numbers that each of us have shared with you today will get stale fast because things are progressing so rapidly. And the good news is VPP as software can continue to take advantage of these advancements as they, as they come live. I'll just close with what you and the audience can now do. If you want more information, here's a link to FIDO, again, the open source project that's responsible for delivering this technology of which all these companies participate in. Um, Calico is a very interesting project. The, I've repeated the link that Jerome shared earlier, uh, just for uh, you know, ease here. And then the third thing is, uh, there's nothing like being able to try it yourself. Um, we are just one vendor, but we do have a free version of our Tensor product. You can go out and get that, there's no obligation, and you can do your own vector packet processing, uh, testing, IPsec centric or otherwise, it won't cost you a penny. So there are three things that you can do to materialize what we've shared with you today. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Jill Lovato. Thank you, Neil. And thank you to all of our uh, wonderful speakers today. We really appreciate your time. Um, this was a really great informative presentation. Um, so now we're going to switch over to Q&A. We've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one that came up is, how can I use VPP for DTLs? And we'll leave this open to any of our presenters to address. 
Okay, I, I can uh, I can take this one. So uh, VPP does uh, you know support uh, layer two, layer three, and layer four. In layer three, we have uh, IPsec, and uh, soon we uh, we're going to have others. Uh, in uh, layer four, because DTLS is an, is is a layer four technology, uh, DTLS today is not supported in VPP. VPP supports uh, a, a quick protocol, which can actually take benefits of uh, the crypto infrastructure. Uh, coming with VPP, so Quick is supported, TLS is supported, TCP is supported, UDP is supported, uh, DTLS is not, um, but of course uh, contributions are more than welcome. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, another question, how does IPSec compare to WireGuard for Kubernetes use cases? Uh, I, I can take this question. Um, WireGuard is an interesting initiative in the Linux kernel to provide uh, encry encrypted tunnels and it's uh, used by a few CNIs today. Um, it shows performance that is a bit better than uh, the kernel implementation of IPsec. Um, but it's using ChaCha20 crypto today, uh, which is significantly slower than AES GCM. Uh, so VPP IPsec is still significantly faster than um, than WireGuard. Great, thank you. Um, another question: Will it support SRV6? Yeah, so uh, VPP supports uh, SRV6 today. Great. It's not in the future; it's already available. Wonderful. Is there a study comparing P4, VPP, and NPL? I am not familiar with a study. Oh, recently, DPDK community did something, I guess, but uh, I'm not sure there is the NPL comparison and P4 comparison. Maybe, John, do, can you take this one? No, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that subject either. Yeah. Okay. I'm not familiar with a study uh, comparing these uh, three things. Okay. Um, possibly fodder for the future. Um, uh, on the website, it only shows support OSPF. Does it support ISIS segment routing as well? Um, no, it does not, not at this time. Okay, thanks. Um, a lot of CNIs are using eBPF to increase their performance. Can eBPF accelerate encryption as well? Uh, no, so that's uh, indeed in Linux kernel, there is more and more. EBPF is getting uh, popular for uh, different things, including kernel telemetry. Some people are using it for packet processing. But when it comes to crypto, I mean, uh, EBPF programs are uh, very simplistic and, and they have to rely on uh, routines coming from Linux kernel. So when it comes to encryption, EBPF cannot help at all, right? So that's why um, VPP, you know, comes with a super fast implementation. And this is not the kind of thing you could do with eBPF in itself. eBPF could call Linux kernel for that and then be constrained by the uh, performance of IPsec in the Linux kernel. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just one more question. Um, I am gonna open it up to last call for questions. If there are any more, please go ahead and um, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, but our question here is, does FIDO VPP support Ike, Ike V2? Uh, uh, well, well, is that Jerome? No, no, uh, I mean, there are multiple. Well, I can start and, and please uh, continue, but uh, there is uh, two levels of a question. So VPP in itself comes with an IKEA implementation, IKEA V2 implementation, but uh, then some other people use also uh, um, other, uh, other uh, options for that. So maybe you can, uh, you can take this one, Anil. Yeah, so as, as Jerome said, uh, VPP does have an IKEA V2 plugin. Um, but it doesn't cover all of the functions that you will need for a live solution. So uh, the plugin can negotiate uh, IKE and IPsec uh, SAs, and it can create a tunnel interface, um, but it does not actually bring up the interface or point any routes to it by itself. It, it needs some help from other software to do that. And this, you know, that's a solvable problem. It gets into how each vendor sort of delivers a solution. I can only speak from a, a NetGate point of view. We use Strong Swan to manage all of the uh, IKE work, and it coupled with VPP will will do what you need. 
So the answer is yes, it support, DDP does support IPv2. By the way, it does not support V1, which is still in high use. But in and of itself, it's probably not a complete solution. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, it looks like uh, we don't have any more questions, so I think we can wrap up for today. Again, thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you for everyone who attended our session, and we hope to see you on another LFN webinar in the near future. Have a great day.